So this is the kind of overview of the talk. I'm going to say very little about the REA actually because um, I, I tend to start talking about that and then it eats into the time I've got to talk about other things. So I shall skip over some of those slides very, very quickly. Um, I, I'll just do one really on um, our main kind of guiding principles. I'll then talk about the big picture context that the UK is in at the moment with respect to meeting its carbon targets, its renewables targets and keeping the lights on. I'll say how biomass helps in that context and then I shall talk about the recent renewables obligation banding review decisions and the consultation that's currently out. I've also got a little video to show you. Um, I don't suppose any of, any of you have seen the video clip of how the biomass cycle the carbon cycle for biomass works. Okay, it's not quite finished. It will be improved further, but there's a three and a half minute interlude in this where you'll get to see that. And then I'll draw a few conclusions. So basically, the Renewable Energy Association is the largest trade body in the UK with respect to numbers of corporate members. We have nearly a thousand corporate members. Uh, they span from large companies to small scale installers. Uh, we cover renewable power, renewable transport fuels, biomethane to grid, and heat. Now, people often say, how can you keep such a large, broad church together? Surely there are inevitably lots of conflict between different technologies. And actually, it, I find that that's not so much the case. And I think that's because we have these kind of basic principles we try to stick to. And we often find that the most tension can occur between companies who are focused in the narrowest area. But anyway, in broad terms, we subscribe to an energy hierarchy. You know, we think the most sensible thing to do is to actually reduce energy consumption through energy conservation, energy efficiency, etc. We need to strive to fill the remaining energy gap with as much renewables as we can, as rapidly as we can. And then the gap that's left, fill that in the most sustainable forms of the choice that you have in front of you. And we generally like to have policy for renewables which doesn't skew the things that a technology developer should be deciding upon themselves. We don't want to have a government policy which kind of steers you in the choice of, of, of a certain technology or sizing a, cert, a project in a certain way, say to hit a higher tariff band than a less generous tariff band. Those are artificial things. They're artificial things that arise from a, a not terribly well-designed policy. And also, a, a project operator should operate the scheme in the manner that suits it best. That's a particular thing for combined heat and power. So, although that's what we strive for, it's not always what we get. And eventually, after saying, well, it would have been better, please do it like this, it would have been better if it was done like that, eventually we do clearly have to start working with what we have. Um, and so we admit when we're beat, really, and then our main objective becomes let's at least keep that policy stable so that we know we're at where we're at as, as project developers and we can actually focus on getting the job done. And a very important thing we subscribe to is we don't want the government trying to pick winners. But this should be up for the market to decide. Increasingly, we're moving away from that at the moment. Uh, we're getting much more into a kind of situation where um, it's almost like the government's centrally planning. It's almost like the days of the CEGB might be returning, um, especially when we move into the electricity market reform days when actually government will effectively be signing contracts per project. Um, and that's, that sort of regime is certainly one which suits the larger projects than the smaller ones because it's far more easy to manage a small number of very large projects than it is to manage a much larger number of smaller projects. Anyway, um, there's lots of benefits of membership of REA. I won't go into them now. Um, we organize ourselves with 10 different sector groups where we really are like almost, I suppose, individual trade associations within an umbrella group. Um, and the ones I've listed there are the ones that are related to biomass. If you want to find out any more, I'd be delighted to talk to you. I do actually have to um, give this talk, go and eat some food. I'll come back for the panel session and questions. Um, and then I've got to go and chair a Dragon's Den thing in another area. So I'm, I'm a bit busy, but I really do <laughs> want to talk to anyone who wants to become a member of the REA or find out more about it. 
We have a wholly owned subsidiary which runs the biofertiliser certification scheme and the green gas certification scheme and also the consumer code. That, that, that subsidiary is called Renewable Energy Assurance Limited and it's most closely associated with the consumer code which is for micro generation. But it does those things directly related to biogas and I thought the audience here might be interested in that. Okay, so moving on to the, the, the main content of the talk. Um, I don't know how well you can see those, the, the, these graphics here, but I'm just trying to get across that we're in a fairly challenging situation at the moment. Um, on Friday last week, Ofgem issued its capacity um, assessment report, which I don't know if you can get the gist of that graph, but there's a ra rather worrying downward line, um, which suggests that from the kind of relatively comfortable position of having a capacity margin of around about 25%. And what that means is there's enough generating capacity to produce 25% more electricity at any, any moment than the country is li likely to need in demand. We're likely to be moving from around about that capacity margin down to um, something which could be as much as 10% or as little as, as zero. Um, and it's not very far away in the context of bringing forward new low carbon electricity generation certainly not the kinds of new carbon sorry not the kinds of low carbon electricity generation that the government wants to see like nuclear ccs i mean renewables can do it with the right environment but nuclear ccs is, is, a, is not going to help with this capacity margin and if we have gas filling that gap as the committee on climate change wrote and that's the letter there that will actually blow their their carbon budgets so the government does have a real dilemma at the moment. Um, we also have a challenging renewables target to meet and you know, the industry is raring to go with that. A bit more stability would help. Um, but the thing that puzzles me really is how, how that um, kind of trio of things translates into a kind of a, a question that keeps getting raised in the media or an assumption that we read about in the media that renewables are somehow feeling very threatened by gas. Um, I mean, to me, that those things say we need as much low carbon generation capacity coming forward as rapidly as we can. Um, it doesn't say to me that we, we must stop doing renewables because we need to do gas. I just don't really understand that. Anyway, so we know what we need to do. And so why has the government gone all cold and wobbly over one thing that could help and that is dedicated biomass generation. Um, just to talk about a few key points along the way because biomass generation was at one time really thought to be something which the government was really gunning for, really wanting to assist and I'm talking about this government even. So it's not over a period of about 26 months we've had a big change around in the government's attitude towards dedicated biomass. So first of all, from 2002 onwards, we had the unbanded renewables obligation, which was not very good for diversity. It brought in the cheapest renewable technologies first, um, and those were landfill gas, the little we had remaining, co-firing and onshore wind. I mean, not bad in itself, but there was a need to bring forward more diverse renewable energy forms. And so the government decided to ban the renewables obligation and give each technology more or less what it needed in order to become commercially competitive um, and, and start deploying. There was an eye to cost effectiveness in that, but the main driver was give each what it needs. And then, when, and then, then there was a terrible time when we realised, or the government realised, that uh, it hadn't actually given biomass or energy from waste projects grandfathering. I mean, the industry thought it was grandfathered, government thought it wasn't grandfathered, and this kind of uh, problem arose uh, back in 2009. And one of the first things that the new coalition government came in, Charles Henry, was announced that, or go through a consultation, and announced the, the, the wonderful news that biomass was now going to be grandfathered. And what that meant was that a project would be sure that it was going to earn 20 years worth of rocks at the, the rock banding level it started out at. In other words, you know, security over future income streams. All very good. The, the, 
we were, we were very pleased with that outcome. The government was working with us. They wanted to know how much capacity might be coming along. They quoted our numbers in their press release. It was all really a feeling very positively of a sort of new renaissance for biomass. It was very welcome. It was cheaper than offshore wind. Um, you know, all systems go. And then uh, we had uh, the bioenergy strategy published by the government and the bioenergy strategy published by the Climate Change Committee. And really things started to go a bit awry. We had, if you look at the yellow um, line there, um, we had government talking about the marginal technology approach. It knew it needs, or it knows it needs, offshore wind in order to meet the targets. And it thinks that's the most expensive technology that it really has to actually start allowing to be funded in order to meet the targets. And therefore, the logic goes that anything that comes in cheaper than offshore wind, should be ma the deployment should be maximized. We should have as much as we can possibly have of anything that's cheaper than offshore wind. Anything that's more expensive than offshore wind, there should be a very good reason for, for doing it. Um, and, and offshore wind clearly you know, needs, needs to be encouraged and given the um, reward level, subsidy level, rock level that it needs to actually commission. Now, that's all very, very well and good, and we can see the logic in that. But subsequent to the Committee on Climate Change report, we have now this focus on carbon emissions as well as simple cost effectiveness in terms of the, the, the pound per megawatt hour of renewables delivered. And that really changes the scene. So, or, and, it, and it matters very, very much what assumptions you make about what fuel source is being offset, etc., etc. And I'm going to go through very, very, in a very high level overview of why I think that the logic is wrong. Well, I, I'll do that in a minute. <laughs> Actually, first of all, I'll, I'll explain what the government is, is setting out or proposing in terms of a cap. What it wants to do, it, it wants to try and have biomass being sent to co-firing or conversions, which is a, a plant formerly burning coal and now burning biomass instead. And it wants biomass to go that route. It doesn't want to have new dedicated biomass projects built because it believes that that is less cost effective in terms of cost per tonne of carbon saved. And therefore, government is now doing all it can to disincentivize future dedicated biomass build. And it's, that is really challenging when you're trying to actually encourage about £200 billion pounds worth of investment in, in the energy infrastructure, much of it based on a subsidy of one form or another. This kind of message, this conversion from enthusiasm pulling through from you know, a couple of years ago to now we don't want you anymore, actually, or we only want a very small amount of you, is, is just not um, helpful in terms of bringing that funding and that, in, uh, that investment into the industry. So basically, they're proposing that suppliers can only um, redeem a certain number of rocks from dedicated biomass, and, and anything beyond that, those rocks are useless to them. So it's their only, they, they realise it's not a perfect solution, but it's their only way of achieving what they're really striving for here, which is letting, for, letting through the projects that are already kind of in construction, um, but only, only that really, looking to have about 500, 600 megawatts of new dedicated biomass capacity coming forward from now on, and then that's it. And the reason for this is these carbon numbers. Basically, I was talking about um, the carbon cost of, of offshore wind and that being the marginal technology. That is the line that you see going across the, the graphic there at about 200, um, uh, 200 pounds per tonne of carbon dioxide saved. And much new dedicated biomass is above that line. Um, so in other words, more expensive. Conversion and co-firing tends to be below that line. But anyway, I wanna, I wanna get onto these assumptions. Um, we don't think it's a fair comparison at all. A new dedicated biomass project is, is thought to be replacing gas on the system, which obviously has lower, em lower emissions than carbon, sorry, lower emissions than, than coal. But if you convert a coal-fired plant into gas, sorry, forgive me, I'm getting a bit mixed up here. If you convert a coal-fired plant into, into biomass, they assume that you're actually displacing um, coal rather than gas. And you could argue that's like building a new project. You could argue that you're displacing gas there. 
The other thing that we think is not correct is that they're comparing the life cycle emissions of biomass with the tailpipe emissions from a, a, a gas plant. It's not a fair comparison. They're taking into account all of the um, transportation of biomass, the harvesting of biomass, processing, etc. But they're not taking into account any of that mining, exploration, leakage, etc. when it comes to, to, to gas. And that could be quite a substantial figure. The government indeed thinks it's about 10% of emissions and there are other studies which suggest it could be even more than that. So you're not comparing like with like. And so if you do do a more fair comparison, what happens actually is this. If this is the, the, um, the sustainability requirement, 200 grams per kilowatt, kilogram per kilowatt hour of um, emissions from dedicated biomass, if you do a fair comparison, it actually moves down to being below that line for dedicated biomass. In other words, if you, if you think that um, you, should, you shouldn't be doing it because it's more expensive than offshore wind, actually it comes in a little bit cheaper than offshore wind in terms of cost per tonne of carbon saved. And when, con when you look at conversion, which is the second yellow um, di uh, diamond there, if you actually compare it in the way we think it should be compared, you actually move a little bit closer to the cost in terms of uh, cost per tonne of carbon saved of offshore wind. So in other words, it, the discrepancy narrows. There is much more of a case for doing dedicated biomass um, and much less of a, a case for making sure you send all of that stuff to conversion. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, and I realise I'm going through it fairly quickly, you know, I'd, I'd be very happy to send you further information about it. Now, um, I'm just going to show you this, this brief video now. How biomass works. Biomass is the name for a range of organic materials that can be used to produce energy. Examples include trees, energy crops like miscanthus, also known as elephant grass, and agricultural byproducts like straw. We can generate heat or electricity from biomass in a way that is close to carbon neutral over the material's life cycle. To understand the environmental benefit of using biomass, let's look at how fossil fuels like coal, oil and natural gas are created. Plants absorb carbon dioxide, or CO2, from the air as they grow. When they die, some of the carbon from the CO2 remains trapped in the decaying vegetation. Over millions of years, these buried layers of vegetation are compressed and transform into either coal, oil or natural gas. The carbon that was removed from the atmosphere is effectively locked underground. Now let's look at two ways you could heat a house. The first example uses a fossil fuel, coal. Coal is extracted from the ground and transported to the house. This process produces CO2 emissions. The fuel is then burnt, providing heat. CO2 from the fossil fuel is released into the atmosphere, increasing CO2 levels. Coal reserves are being depleted and atmospheric CO2 levels are rising. This life cycle is unsustainable. Let's look at a biomass alternative, in this case, wood. A tree grows, absorbing several years' worth of CO2 from the atmosphere. The carbon from that CO2 is trapped within the tree. Firewood is harvested and transported to the house. This process produces CO2 emissions, and we will come back to these later. The wood is burnt, providing heat. The CO2 absorbed by the tree is released back into the atmosphere. New trees are grown and the cycle continues. The fuel is being replaced and CO2 emissions are minimal. This life cycle is sustainable. CO2 emissions from processing and transportation can be offset by growing more biomass than is required for fuel. We have shown how biomass can heat a house, but the idea can be scaled up. Instead of using the wood for heat, it could be used in a power station for generating electricity. 
to be environmentally beneficial, the life cycle must be well managed. If we use biomass faster than we grow it, we end up with more CO2 in the atmosphere and deforestation. This is unsustainable. If we grow enough biomass to replace what is being used, we have a sustainable system. It would even be possible to reduce atmospheric CO2 using this model. Well-managed biomass can be regarded as a source of renewable energy. Just put that, that video together to just try and get across that, that simple concept. You can keep carbon locked underground and get your energy if you use biomass. Um, and, and it's sustainable, it's carbon neutral, etc. It's not quite finished that video. We're going to de-emphasise the emissions from transport because you know we, we're trying to show that, but we it, it does rather overemphasise that is a small element of, of things really for either um, biomass or fossil fuel. Anyway, moving on, um, there's a leaflet about this on your on your chair. Basically, you can host this this um, little video or indeed many others. There's all sorts of other renewable energy technologies there on your website for the cost of, I don't know, two, two pints of beer, three pints of beer a month. Very, very cost effective uh, means of getting a concept across to people. And you can get a discount on that um, by using the code that's on this leaflet. So just to draw conclusions, um, we don't think that the current consultation which proposes capping biomass is helpful either to meeting the renewables target it will be a threat and detriment to existing employment in project development of, of new dedicated biomass projects. More importantly, it will threaten future employment, which could be as much as 65,000 jobs um, in the future. And those are figures by AEA Technology, co um, commissioned by the Renewables Advisory Board some time ago. And it's not helpful towards energy security and the, the reducing capacity margin I mentioned. It's not based either on sound logic, we don't think, um, and we really hope that the government does a, a, a U-turn on this. There are a couple other things that it, it changed its mind on recently following the Renewables Banding um, Review, both of which we were supportive of and, and are asking the government to do. So we're pleased about those two things and we hope, really hope, that with um, taking, listening to the industry, listening to the evidence, that government will decide not to implement, implement that very sort of discriminatory and unfair cap on, on biomass. So we, I hope you share those conclusions and will be interested to um, find out more and respond to the government in your own um, time.